Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this tax day of 2015. Uh, first, I would like to thank Cindy Thompson from Alternative Communication Services for providing CART this evening. And welcome Drs. Anthony Ricci and Alan Chang, both of the Stanford Initiative to Cure Hearing Loss at Stanford University. And um, I'm very excited about this presentation. This is a um, very fascinating topic. And um, I welcome you to present Reshaping Antibiotics to Prevent Hearing Loss. I know you have a lot to present, so I'll let you uh, take the floor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Alan Chang. I'm a, a pediatric otologist, so I see kids with uh, hearing loss and other ear problems, and I also a clinician scientist, so my research interest is in uh, aminoglycoside toxicity and also um, regeneration of the inner ear. Um, alongside with me is Tony Ricci. He's a professor uh, in uh, otolaryngology as well as molecular cellular uh, physiology. He is, he's an expert in uh, inner ear uh, biology and biophysics and also auditory physiology. So I hope you guys have finished your taxes already, and if not, you still have a few more hours to go. Um, so we're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so discussing a topic um, on uh, how we, a journey that we have taken to reshape uh, uh, antibiotics to preserve hearing. Um, we're going to divided into several parts and then uh, Tony Ricci and I has would, would be tagging team and go through this uh, in uh, in detail so overall we're going to tell you a little bit about how aminoglycoside antibiotics work um, how uh, the, the side effects actually include causing hearing loss we're going to go through several approaches from others as well as our approach to prevent aminoglycoside toxicity and lastly um, we want to uh, share with you some of the recent work that we have done to um, successfully decrease the toxicity of the amino glycosides. So I think uh, it's safe to say that um, all of us have unfortunately experienced infection at some point in our lives, whether you have a completely intact immune system or uh, for whatever reason, you have a weak uh, immune system, whether from genetics or from uh, some kind of uh, treatment, um, and this warrants uh, treatment. And uh, because of the advance of so many antibiotics available, uh, some of the side effects have been resistant organisms that have developed. Uh, fortunately, there are still available um, many effective antibiotics, and the one we want to focus on this class of antibiotics called aminoglycosides. Um, it is, it's been around for a very long time, even before I started studying medicine, um, and it's still very effective. In fact, this is probably the most commonly prescribed antibiotics worldwide. Uh, it's still very popular because it has very broad uh, spectrum activities, meaning that it covers a variety of um, uh, organisms, and these include bacteria, um, that normally lives, lives in our body. Uh, mycobacteria, so it's a special kind of bacteria that includes uh, tuberculosis. Um, so aminoglycoside is also very potent, uh, meaning that is, is um, and it has a very low incidence of drug resistance, meaning that the organism that is being treated has a very low likelihood of developing a way to overcome the drug effects. Uh, in fact, it has been called by uh, World Health Organization being one of the most important classes of antibiotics. And what I didn't list here, an important part is that it's a very uh, cheap antibiotic because it has been around for a very long time. Uh, it is uh, very cost effective and um, many clinicians tend to be um, used to using something that works all the time, so this is a popular drug uh, used by uh, in, the, in the clinic. Uh, what I put down below is one of these amino glycosides called gentamicin, probably uh, one of the more popular ones. Um, 
and this is the one that we'll be discussing in a little bit more details later. So who uh, who receives this amino antibiotic? Um, it has very wide clinical applications, like I said, um, and it primarily uh, targets uh, a kind of bacteria called gram-negative bacteria. Uh, and this kind of bacteria tend to live in, uh, in the lungs, in the urinary tract, in the gastrointestinal area, and those are the areas that can get uh, bogged down with this kind of infection. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, tuberculosis, which is a kind of mycobacteria, and that can cause problems in the lungs. Um, many patients still receive aminoglycosides quite frequently. Uh, and this includes uh, patients of the extreme ends of the ages, the neonates and the elderly when their immune system uh, are compromised and also expectant mothers um, who can, who we don't want to risk getting an infection. So in fact, in uh, neonates and expectant mothers when they develop signs of infection, even before they're confirmed to have a real infection, aminoglycosides are uh, frequently administered uh, before, uh, just to prevent the chance of getting an infection. Um, another population is cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, they tend to have uh, trouble clearing the secretions from their lungs and from their sinuses, and they tend to actually get colonized with a kind of gram-negative uh, bacteria that we we require repeated dosing of the aminoglycoside antibiotics. So these are the patients um, that tend to receive a lot of these antibiotics. So it's my turn. Tony is going to tell you a little bit about how these antibiotics work. So now you're going to see I to use an applicant. So now you're going to see a little movie of how aminoglycosides kill antibiotics, kill bacteria. So the aminoglycosides can enter into a broad range of bacteria and they interact with the ribosome. The ribosome is the molecular machinery that's responsible for generating all of the proteins within the bacteria. The aminoglycoside alters protein synthesis so that the bacteria doesn't isn't able to produce the proteins it needs, and this leads to the bacteria uh, dying. Uh, Dr. Ricci, were you going to show the video from your uh, desktop? We just did. Oh, were you going to see it? Is this, is this uh, uh, No, plan? you didn't share it. Give me one second. Hold on. Can you see the slide now? Oops. No, are, are you on the um, application sharing icon at the top? Yes. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Did you see no. the other slides before? You haven't seen any slides. Oh wow! Okay. Um, well, it's not too late. We can start looking at this one. Can you see yeah. this? Yes. Okay. So this is the movie of the aminoglycoside going into the bacteria. It interacts with the ribosome and and alters protein synthesis. The, the lack of proteins within the bacteria ultimately leads to the bacteria dying. And so in designing new aminoglycosides, we want to make sure that this, that the ability of the aminoglycoside remains so that it can still kill the bacteria. Okay, so a major side effect of aminoglycosides is that they cause hearing loss. And this can be in up to 60% of patients that take it. And the, the damage grows with repeated usage. In addition, there's also kidney damage and, and vestibular damage. So uh, all of the inner ear is, is affected. 
and this damage is is remarkable in that it is it targets very selectively the sensory cells, which are called hair cells, in uh, in this in the, in the ear. And uh, so now, one of the first questions we we were addressing is, well, why it, why the sensory cells? Why the hair cells and not other cells in the ear? And so. Now I'm going to take you through a couple slides that just talk a little bit about how the ear works and where the sensory cells are to set up the, the basic ideas. So this is a cartoon of the ear. So you have the external ear. Uh, sound goes through the external ear. It, it vibrates the tympanic membrane, uh, which vibrates the, uh, the middle ear bones, which impinge on the cochlea. So uh, now. This is a cross section of the cochlea. It gets its name because it's a coiled structure. These sensory cells in the basal membrane sit within the little box that's, that's shown um, on the lower side of the cartoon. And, uh, and if we zoom in on that area, you can see the purple cells. There are three rows, and those are called outer hair cells. And then there's the blue cells, which are the inner hair cells. Vibration of the, the light purple cells, which make up the basal membrane, causes movement of the sensory cells. And the, and the sensory cells can, uh, can sense this vibration uh, because of these, this array of what's called stereocilia sitting on the top of the cells. So these protrusions will vibrate when sound comes in. And uh, so now you can see a zoom, a zoom in of two of these stereocilia, where there is what's called a tip link that connects the two cilia and an MET channel. MET stands for mechanotransduction. So the vibration moves these stereocilia and it pulls on this link. And pulling on this link will cause these channels to open or close. So we're giving you this much detail about how the system works because what is unique to hair cells is the presence of this mechanically gated channel. And it's our hypothesis that the aminoglycosides can enter through this channel. And so they accumulate within the sensory cell and can then kill the sensory cell in a similar manner to the way they kill the bacteria. So our goal was to prevent entry into this channel. Hand it off. This time, Alan, with the slides. That's right. Now I actually have pictures to show you. So you don't have to just look at B. So this is kind of the idea that uh, Dr. Ricci has alluded to, that uh, for the drugs to cause damage, to cause hearing loss, it has to kill hair cells in the ear, the mechanical sensitive cells. And then for them to kill the hair cells, this is like, this is our, done by an illustrator, does a very nice movie of this, for the amino glycosides to kill hair cells, they actually have to go inside the inner ear, and then when they actually get close to the hair cells, they have to go through this mechanical transduction channel located at the tip of the stereocilia. These are ion channels, so normally ions go through them. But amino glycosides are small enough and charged enough so they can also go in, and they, this causes the hair cells to degenerate. So this obviously goes through a cascade of reactive oxygen species, active, activate the machinery to execute cell death. And then when the hair cells die, as you know, this is irreversible. No, there's no re regeneration of hair cells spontaneously. So we try to prevent this entry as a way to protect hair. So um, there are many ways to look at the cochlea. We have animal models that we can actually um, take out their hearing organ, the cochlea, for us to um, look at these hair cells more carefully. In this case, this is a culture model in a petri dish that we can harvest the cochlea from these little animals that we can put them in a the petri dish, put them in uh, media and um, adjust the atmosphere. And then we can also put amino glycosides directly in the petri dish and let this tissue grow for a couple of days. And at the end, we can fix it, stain it with particular, for particular proteins. 
so that we can analyze what exactly happened to these hair cells. And you can see this cochlea on the very far right here is divided into apex, middle, and base. This is an atonotopic gradient, meaning that the high frequency sounds usually vibrate the hair cells at the basal turn of the cochlea, and then conversely, in the apex is where the low frequency sounds uh, tend to vibrate. And when we put this, um, when they put the tissue under a microscope and then stain for what we call the uh, actin, a part, a part of the hair cells, you can see that the hair cells are labeled just like uh, Dr. Richie said before, three rows of outer hair cells, one row of inner hair cells at the bottom. And this is obviously uh, labeled uh, with a fluorescent um, protein, so we can see its fluorescence uh, under a microscope. Now, what I'm showing you on the left, lower left uh, now, is um, we want to actually determine that the amino glycosides do go into hair cells. So what we have done here <coughs> is actually label the amino glycoside with a fluorescent protein called Texas Red. And what I'm just showing you is this black and white. And this is a movie that is um, captured in a fluorescent microscope over about an hour. So you can, you can actually see the hair cells slowly become brighter meaning that the fluorescent amino glycoside have actually entered the hair cells and then the number of the amino glycoside go up over time and that's why it's brighter. So I'll play this again. No, normally the hair cells were dark and then as the amino glycosides accumulate, they become brighter. And these other cell types you can see, they are not really affected. And then if we actually let this go longer in culture, then these hair cells would eventually die. So first they enter the hair cells, then they cause problems in hair cells, and they kill the hair cells. So just to show you this idea that the entry of the drug into hair cells is important, is the important first step of uh, the injury. Showing on the top left here is the gentamicin labeled with the fluorescent protein call it GTTR. And then again, the picture shows you that in the apex and then the middle, you can see the red labeling that's where the hair cells, a band of hair cells are labeled. But then on the top right picture, uh, what we've done in, in this case is have a um, the cochlea in the petri dish that have been co-treated with a blocker of the mechanotransduction channel called curare, which is obviously a toxin, but it also happens to block the mechanotransduction channel. So when we block the channel and also add the fluorescent amino glycoside, you can see that there's no more red labeling, so meaning that the drug uh, was not able to enter the hair cells. So shown at the bottom two graphs here are the outer hair cells on the bottom left and inner hair cells on the bottom right. And then on the y-axis is the fluorescence intensity. So the, the taller, than, the bigger the number, the, the brighter uh, the hair cells are, the meaning that there are more amino glycosides that have gone in. And then you can see the red columns, uh, red bars, are a lot lower than the black bars. And the red bars, meaning that they have when we actually block the mechanotransduction channel, then there is a, a lot less amino glycoside having gone into the uh, hair cells. So, um, like I said, if we let the culture go on for a little bit more, we can actually see if this decreased entry of the drug into hair cells actually does any protection. And so that's exactly what we want to do to see when we actually culture this for um, five days total, we can see there are nice organization of four rows of hair cells. Next, if we treat this with the, the amino glycosides, gentamicin, you can see in the base and the middle region, there is now loss of hair cells, primarily the outer hair cells. So there's obvious loss. Um, there are different kinds of um, 
mechanotransduction channel blocker. One of them is called quinine. You can see when we co administer quinine with aminoglycoside gentamicin, then the hair cells are preserved throughout the apex, middle, and basal turn of the cochlea. And earlier I showed you curare, which is a mechanotransduction channel blocker that was able to block the entry of amino glycoside uh, into hair cells. And now it also preserves, increases the survival of hair cells in this preparation. Um, so another way to um, block the entry of amino glycoside into hair cells um, is to actually affect this protein at the top of the stericilia, showing the picture here. You can see this little blue string called tip link. That's the link between the stericilia. This is actually quite important. If it's in the absence of this protein, then the mechanotransduction channel is basically closed. So the idea is that if we actually use a genetic model that is absent, that is deficient in this tip link protein, and we're able to find the same finding, that the hair cells are not able to pick up the amino glycosides, then it will confirm our suspicion that mechanotransduction is critical for the entry and survival of um, hair cells. So I apologize, there are quite a few pictures on the right. So let's just look at the labeling on the very top of the three columns. So wild type means that the animals, these are mice in this case, they have all the copies of the um, tip links. The middle one, CDH23, that means they have one copy. So they have 50% of the tip links available. And the very far right, CDH23, V2J, V2J, that means they have absolutely no tip links present in their hair cells. So if we go down the first column here, just like the movie I showed you earlier, we apply the amino glycoside that have been labeled with a fluorescent protein, so GTTR. You can see if you go down from two minutes down all the way to 60 minutes, you see the hair cells start to get brighter and brighter. That means there's uptake of the amino glycoside into them. If we go down the middle column now, you still see an up, you still see uptake of the drug into hair cells, so they are still able to enter the hair cells. And then if you go to the very last column, then where the tippling protein is absent in these animals, then you don't see any more uptake of the amino glycoside into the hair cells. So this really, all, with all these experiments that we have shown you so far, this really suggests that if we were able to block the entry of amino glycoside into hair cells, um, we were able to de um, protect the hair cells from dying. So um, I want to now give it back to Tony Ricci. Uh, to tell you about uh, some of the, um, oh, sorry. <coughs> Actually, let me go through this slide, I apologize. So uh, the basic concept would be uh, if we just co-apply a mechanotransduction channel blocker, um, when we actually give the patients amino glycosides, then perhaps we can protect. Unfortunately, um, most of the mechanotransduction channels blockers are not specific. For example, we would never consider giving a patient curare, which is an obvious uh, toxin. And quinine actually has a major problem of, of causing heart arrhythmia. So, um, and we don't know the exact molecular composition of the mechanotransduction at this point. So we decided to take a slightly different approach, which is going to really to the root of the problem, is to directly uh, modify the amino glycoside compound so that it is uh, not able to enter hair cells. Um, so how do we do that? Um, we went back to the drawing board. Uh, since amino, amino glycoside has been around for so many years, uh, there's actually been quite a bit of work 
characterizing how it binds to the ribosome, the protein synth uh, synthesis uh, portion of bacteria, to determine what are the critical portions of the amino glycoside that is required for binding the bacteria ribosome, thus actually being uh, an antibiotic antibacterial. So there's crystallography structure data that are available for us to determine which part of the amino glycoside not to touch or modify. Uh, there's also, um, this is an area that uh, Dr. Ricci has worked on for many years to actually look at what are the biophysical properties of the uh, mechanical transduction channel. Um, so we know that it allows possibly charged ions to go through, and we know the um, indirectly the dimensions of this channel. So we decided to use these pieces of information uh, to design a new class of uh, amino glycosides antibiotics. Okay. So just to first summarize what Alan has shown you so far is our, our basic hypothesis was that amino glycosides target inner cells selectively because they go through the specialized channel. And so now we presented four independent pieces of data that show that this seems to be the case. And so the next step was to modify the amino glycoside to make it less likely to, to go through the channel. And so this movie illustrates the concept of what we want to do, which, which is to modify the amino glycoside so that it won't go through this ion channel, but it will still enter the bacteria and have its effect on the ribosomes. So in the first pass of drug synthesis, we made nine different compounds to do that. And I'm going to show you some of the results from, from these sections. So this now what you're looking at here is a plot of hair cell number at three different locations, the base, the middle, and the apex. The control, the black, are, are untreated animals. And so you have 100% of the hair cells. And then the parent drug that we used is called sisomycin. So cisomycin is a precursor of genomycin, and we selected it because we could get it in high quantities at very pure levels. So it made the chemistry a little bit easier. You can see that the dose we selected is very toxic. So the base, there's almost no cells left, and there's more than half the cells gone in the apex. So now, these are nine different compounds, and it doesn't matter what they, which ones they are. What's, it, what's important to notice is that all of these compounds are less ototoxic than the parent compound. And in particular, if you look at the, the blue compounds, they're virtually not ototoxic at the dose that we used here. So then the next question was, what we did was we picked one of these uh, and did a full range of doses of drugs. So this is our control you're seeing here, the hair cells. And then the picture of systemizing, which is the parent, and you can see there are no hair cells left. So if we plot how much damage there is against the concentration of the dose of the drug, you get this type of curve. And the midpoint of that curve is right around 94 micromolar. So 94 micromolar is the dose that will kill half of the cells. If you look at the lower left panel, that's our new compound, N1NS. And you can see that all the hair cells are left at the same dose. And so if we do a dose response curve here, you can see that this curve is shifted very far to the right. So now, instead of 94 micromolar, it's 3,500 micromolar is required to damage 50% of the hair cells. So a 37-fold shift in the, in the plot. And so what this shows is that if we stop the drug from going through this channel, we can have a dramatic effect on ototoxicity. The question is, do we still have antimicrobial activity? And so in this assay, there are two measures. One is called a minimal inhibitory concentration, which is, the, which is a measure of whether or not we stop the bacteria from dividing. And the second lower panel is called a minimum bactericidal concentration. And that is the dose that it takes to actually kill the existing bacteria. 
the first row, which is the orange, was the parent compound. And you can see that in our first pass, three of our compounds had antimicrobial activity that was comparable to the parent compound. And so we selected one of these, the N1MS circled here, to test further in, um, in animal studies. And so now all of the data that we've shown you so far was done in cochlear cultures. So now we're switching and we're taking adult animals, we're giving them an injection of physicomycin or our new compound, N1MS. We're doing hearing tests, examples shown here, which is called an ABR, which is the auditory brainstem response. What you can see is as you go from 20 to 80 dB, which is the, how loud the sound gets, you can see that you get a bunch of squiggly lines. The first peak, the first peak is the output of the cochlea. It's the synchronous firing of all the nerves coming out of the cochlea. So in control, you can see that that peak is happening between 30 and 40 dB. Then if you treat with uh, the cystomycin, you can see that you don't see these peaks anymore. So in this case, this animal is that. However, if you treat with our new drugs, you see the squiggly lines are there. And again, it's between 20 and 30 dB where you see them, see it happening. So we can, this was done at one frequency, at 23 kilohertz. But we can summarize across different frequencies. And so these two plots, the plot on the left is called, is the auditory brainstem response. And the, the x-axis are the different frequencies that we're using. And the y-axis is the intensity of sound required to get that first peak. The control is the black, black trace. And so the smaller the number, the more sensitive your ear. So the systemizing in this case uh, requires extremely loud sounds if, uh, to generate any type of response. Now the other, the other uh, trace, TPOAE, that's called, it's called a distortion product autoacoustic emission. And what that is, is that it's a direct measure of the function of the outer hair cells. The ear is able to generate sound. And if, so if you put, play two sounds together into the ear, because of the mechanical properties of the cochlea, you will actually get three sounds out. And we're measuring this third sound. And this third sound is directly related to functioning of outer hair cells. And, it, and again, the plot that we're showing you here is frequency on X, which is the, the frequency of the tones we're putting in. And the threshold level is how loud we have to go in order to get this output. Here, too, what you see is that the systemizing takes much louder sounds. It means that we basically have killed off the outer hair cells. So now when we try our drug, you can, which is the blue trace, you can see that it looks very much like the black trace. So there's basically no loss of hair cells or hearing with this new drug. If we go longer in time, so the first set was one week after. The second set that's up there now is a month after the treatment. And you can see that hearing is retained with our compound and it's still lost with the parent compound. We went to higher doses. And this high dose shown in the light blue color with our new compound, we were able to get hearing loss. So now this, as you can see, it's 400 milligrams per kilogram. This dose of the pair compound killed all of the animals. So 100% of the animals died when given this dose. Uh, and with our compound, we got some hearing loss, but no animals died in the process. So, we also then, after um, doing the hearing test, we sacrificed the animals and we looked at the cochlea. And so what you're seeing in H are the three rows of outer hair cells and the row of inner hair cells. Then with systemizing, you can see there are no outer hair cells left. And with the new compound, N1MS, you can see that all the hair cells are still there. So the, the morphology the counts of hair cells matches the physiology of the brainstem distortion products that we measure. And we summarize that in the next plot. Again, you're looking at apex, middle, and base. 
100% is the control in the black, and the parent compound, cysomycin, is in red. So you can see that we're really doing a lot of damage with the parent compound. However, the new compound does almost no damage at a week, and when you go to a month, it does no damage. And you have to go to this high dose of 400 milligrams uh, to see hair cell loss. So with all the compounds, we had good agreement between the morphology and the physiology. And we had to go to more than three times the dose, about three times the dose of our new compound to get any type of hearing loss at all. So does the new compound actually still kill bacteria in vivo? And so for this, we went to a urinary tract infection model where we inject E. coli into the bladder of the mice. And then we uh, treat with aminoglycosides a day later. And at day one, four, and six, we could count how, uh, how many colonies, how much bacteria was left in the urine. And you can see that in, in all, at all three time points, the parent compound, cysomycin, and the new compound, N1MS, were both, both effectively destroyed all the bacteria as compared to control. On day six, we have sacrificed the animals and investigated both the bladder and the kidneys to see if there was any infection remaining. Again, both this parent compound and our new compound were equally uh, effective at um, eliminating the bacterial infection. So that's good. So what we've shown you today are proof of principle experiments that demonstrate that we can separate ototoxicity from antimicrobial activity. That we can do this by preventing the aminoglycosides from entering into the sensory cells. We have I've shown you one compound where we had 37 times less ototoxicity. There was, I didn't show you, there was a little bit of loss of antimicrobial activity. Um, and where we're going with this. So there's a, there's a lot of experiments to do before we get to uh, human patients. One is to develop a multi-dose model where we inject uh, multiple times to, uh, with, with our aminoglycosides to, to more closely mimic what happens in the clinic uh, and see how effective they are antimicrobially and also uh, do they remain non-toxic. Uh, we're moving to another animal model, which is better than the mouse that we've done so far, so we can better assess kidney function. Thus far, the kidney function data suggests that um, our new compound uh, is likely better than the parent compound for renal function as well. And then what we want to do is to select across the whole class of aminoglycosides and try to do the same type of manipulations on aminoglycosides that are better at killing some bacteria than other bacteria. So to try to mimic the use of aminoglycosides now in the clinic with um, and modify, modify those for the, for the different indications and then test to see if, if we can carry that out. Uh, so as with any research project, there's lots of people involved. I can't go through all of, the, all of these people. This project so far is in its, about its fifth year of work. We've been fortunate to be funded through internally through what's called a SPARC program. We've also had funding from NIH to carry this work out. We're hoping for more funding from NIH to continue. We work with a variety of different companies to make the drugs, to test the drugs. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, so I guess we're ready for questions. Okay, thank you very much. It was all very interesting. Um, I do see uh, one question so far, and that is um, from Dee in Florida. And I guess she's, she's, uh, she must be facing surgery, so she's wondering, you know, what options there are at this point for antibiotics um, that are not ototoxic. What would you recommend? Can you repeat the question? Uh, Dee in Florida wants to know if she were to have surgery now, what are the other options for 
uh, antibiotics that are not ototoxic. Okay. Um, so, fortunately, there are many options and many other options than amino glycosides um, that can be used as prophylaxis before surgery, obviously, depending on the kind of surgery that he is having. Um, I think it is, I mean, there are with some exceptions. People do not usually use amino glycosides for prophylaxis for surgery at this point, and even if they do, it's a single dose. So she, I would obviously, she should talk to her doctor about the risks and benefits of the medications before getting them. What is the time, what is your timeline for, um, you talked about the future of your project, what's, what's the timeline before you will test on human patients? Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question, the timeline of when the drugs could be tested in humans. I think um, we're still a, a few, uh, quite a number of years out from having a first patient to be tested. I think there are still um, a number of animal models that we would like to test and obviously a large number of compounds we want to uh, test out first to see which is the best candidate to move to this different animal model. Uh, as Dr. Ricci alluded to earlier, some of the animal models we have tested so far are what we call small animals. Uh, and they, uh, are similar, they have similar hearing mechanism, but they, the hearing mechanism is a little bit different than what we see in humans. And we also want to test the kidney function as well. So I think we have to go through those steps first. And there's quite a few uh, bars or hoops you have to jump through to get approval from the FDA for any type of testing uh, in, in humans. And for antibiotics in general, this is a very high bar. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons there's not a whole lot of people investing in antibiotics at this point because the, the efforts to get through the FDA make it very uh, cost ineffective. Um, the next question. Um, uh, okay. There's a lot of safety. Lot of safety. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the next question, if I understand correctly, um, says, can you pre-screen your chances of risk? I guess if you were being prescribed an antibiotic, are some people more prone to hearing loss over others? So there is one screen for uh, mitochondrial defects that makes uh, people much more sensitive to immunoglycoside toxicity. So there is a screen that you can have done, a genetic test that you could have done for that. T typically, those immunoglycosides are used when, we, when you need a, an immediate response. So you have a severe infection, it's kind of a death or dead type situation, and they have to work really quickly. So it's not something that's, that's going to happen uh, prophylactically in, in, a, in a normal surgical type of setting. Uh, they don't need to, they have other compounds there. So there are, is a screen, to, uh, typically the screen takes a while to do, so it's not practically useful in terms of using aminoglycosides. Uh, but in cases where it can be used, uh, it, is, it is useful because I, I don't know, what's it, 40%? I think it's around 40% of the toxicity um, or the higher sensitivity to aminoglycosides has this mitochondrial defect. Are doctors that are prescribing aminoglycosides aware of uh, this possible side effect and um, do they keep up with the research being done on uh, the ototoxic drugs in, uh, in your research? Uh, yes, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't want to give the impression to scare everyone away from getting antibiotics. That's not the message I want to send. Um, I, this is a very effective antibiotic and it has a very long track record. Um, um, so I would be surprised if, there, if the doctors prescribing this medicine are not aware of the side effects which are damaged to the kidney and ear. Uh, there are many measures that 
they are routinely taken to monitor the blood level of this drug to prevent, to minimize the risk uh, of, it, of this side effects, but not, you know, every time you take a drug, there's always a potential side effect. Uh, it's not zero. Um, and obviously, the longer you take the drug, the drug, the higher the doses they give you, the chances tend to go up. So um, I, I think the doctors who prescribe it, and I recently went to a conference uh, where pulmonologists go to, and their, their main concern was amino glycoside toxicity. So that the, these are the doctors who are actively practice, practicing and they doing their best to keep up to date on this research. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions at, uh, at this time. Um, so I want to thank you again for presenting this evening. Uh, very fascinating and we hope that you'll come back again and give us another update um, in the future. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Again, this uh, has been recorded so that you can watch it again on our, our website. We usually get it posted within a couple of weeks. And again, thank you, Cindy Thompson, for providing CART this evening. Thank you, and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Thanks again, doctors. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.